If you've got a Bible, you can turn to um, 2 Samuel chapter 13, and uh, maybe verse, go to verse 21. I think I had 23 written down in the, uh, in the bulletin, but I'm going to back up a couple of verses, double up a little bit, because um, if you've been with us for a while, you know we've been taking this long walk through the, the life of King David. We're in this section where, um, you know, some of the the shadier, the less awesome, the more human and broken parts of David's life, his family, his kingdom are coming to light. And we've paused this for the last couple of weeks. We had a, um, a guest speaker from Empower Ministries last week. The week before that, we were at camp. So this has been a little bit of a gap. Even if you're like, I've never missed one, you might be like, where were we? What's going on? So um, we'll, uh, we'll do a little bit of review. But I want to, uh, I want to start... Um, I want to start with a line from a poem. And as soon as I put that in my notes, I thought of the, one of my pastors growing up, this great, this great Scottish preacher that was in our church in Ontario. And he, uh, he often had, had a poem in that he had so many poems memorized, he would just like recite them. I don't have his great accent, so I'm not going to do the whole thing. But there's a line from a poem in, in W.H. Auden's poem, September 1st, 1939. That's the name of the poem. He penned this well-known verse. He writes, I and the public know what all school children learn. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. He's not saying something controversial there. He's saying, we all know this is how it goes. He's speaking politically. He says, grown-ups know what we all learned. You know, you observe school children. You observe any humans in a group. And this seems to be one of the rules at play. Those to whom evil is done do evil in return. And you could put a little asterisk besides evil, right? It's like, well, evil according to who? Evil according to me. If I didn't like the way that went, I will try to... Well, we don't always say get revenge. Some people will say that, and in a way, I admire the honesty. Because a lot of the time, we're like, no, 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 no. I'm not, out. I'm not vengeful. I'm not trying to get revenge. I'm just wanting justice. I think seeking revenge for perceived wrongs, as I said, it's practically a human instinct. I think all of us have acted on it at some point, and I think all of us have been on the receiving end of somebody seeking revenge for some wrong that we have done or they perceive that we've done to them. And without diving into a full philosophy of revenge, I will just say that I, I suspect it finds our root, like I said, in that part of the image of God in us, that God-given sense of justice, right? When a wrong is done, there needs to be some kind of redress, some kind of retribution. Something needs to, it's not, it's not enough that the bad things stop happening, but there's, there's a scale to be balanced. And I think, you know, like the Bible's very, very clear that God is, is a God of justice. And I think that sense that we have, that comes from God, except it's twisted by our sinful nature. And so we want, we want justice, but through a self-seeking lens. The passage we're looking at this morning centers around an act of revenge. Though, as we will see, I think there's more going on here than meets the eye. And it's going to unfold in the next couple of weeks as well. But one thing I hope we will note as we continue our look at kind of the underbelly of David's kingdom is that revenge does not bring healing. It simply adds to the grief. That's counterintuitive in the moment, right? Like I said, it's an instinctive response. Um, but it, it, revenge doesn't bring healing. The Bible is consistent in its teaching, and especially in the, in the teachings of Christ, that, that revenge is not something that we are to seek. But if you do a little bit of a Google search, um, not everyone agrees, but there are many secular philosophers, counselors, psychologists, there's lots of school of thought that are like, hey guys, we've discovered, revenge actually doesn't, it doesn't satisfy that thing. You've got this, this it feels like a hole that you want to fill, or there's something that needs balancing, and it's like revenge seems like, and it, and it ends up letting you down, or it ends up causing more problems. And I think we see, we see that happening here. It doesn't bring healing. It just adds to the grief. 
So we're going to look at 2 Samuel 13, um, verses 23 to 39. In the first part of this chapter, we were introduced to some of David's kids, his firstborn son named Amnon, and then his thirdborn, although as I said a couple of weeks ago, we don't know much about this secondborn. I don't even know if he's still alive at this point. You've got Amnon, this other guy, Kiliab, Chiliab, Daniel, he goes by a couple of names. He's, you've got Amnon, and then you've got Absalom, David's son, Amnon's brother from another mother, literally, okay, and, and then Absalom's sister, Tamar. And we read how Amnon um, became enamored with and ended up being like lustfully obsessed with Tamar, and he ends up uh, engineering a way that he can have his way with her against her will. And it's a mess. We jump in here at at uh, verse 21, and it says, when King David heard of all of these things, the whole thing that went on with, with Amnon and Tamar, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister, Tamar. After two full years, Absalom had sheep shearers, at Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but he gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, then please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king said to him, why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he, sorry, I blinked and I lost it. Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Then Absalom commanded his servants, mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine. Watch when Amnon has had lots to drink and he's getting a little bit vulnerable. Um, Do not fear, or no, he says, wait, um, mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not fear. Have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. And then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. So we have this plot working out. A two-year gap, and then this incident happening. And I want us to see some some pieces of this. There's some contrasts and parallels here. First, I want us to see the words versus deeds. And we touched on this at the tail end of the the message a couple of weeks ago, but I want to just review it in those first couple of verses that we read. After it has come to light that Amnon has raped his stepsister, Um, the king was furious. David was angry. Um, He likely said as much. It got recorded, right? This wasn't deep in David's heart. He was troubled by that. I mean, it came out. So he was furious with his words, but he seems silent in his actions. It's not recorded that he did anything to redress this, to make it right. He has a, a legal problem on his hands, in a way, right? I'm not an expert in the Old Testament law, but my understanding is in an incident like this where a young man forces himself on a young woman, the law requires that he marry her. Like, you don't get to just love her and leave her. It's like, you need to take care of her because she's yours now. But the law also said that siblings aren't supposed to marry. So it's one of those, you know, this is a legal thing. He should have been sorting this out. It does not seem, it seemed like he just, he got mad and then let it sit. But you contrast that in those verses with um, Absalom. And it says, he didn't say anything to Amnon, good or bad. He, hmm? no, that's fine, right? He was one of those people that he doesn't seem to get mad, but he's thinking, right? He is planning for action when the time was right. And then we see here two years later what he had been planning. There's a contrast as well um, between, between Amnon and Absalom in, in that one had a short-sighted view and the other seems to take the long view, right? Amnon, his whole 
Um, his whole plan, the incident that we read of a couple of weeks ago, um, his plan to, uh, to not even seduce, just to be able to overpower Tamar, um, it was a very short-sighted plan, right? It was a lustful plan. It was fueled by his impatience. It said he was making himself just sick, longing for this girl, and he's just like, I just need, I just need her. He couldn't think about anything else. It was a very short-sighted plan. Absalom, though, he seems to be, he's a long-term planner. His plan that we see here is, it's a long game kind of thing, and it's not fueled by impatience. It's not a rash, emotional decision, like a spur of the moment. In, in, you know, oh, in the heat of the moment, I just snapped. He's not, no, no, this is, this is calculated. And it's fueled, I think, by his ambition. Now, so far, what we've read could be like, really, by his ambition? Isn't it more fueled by, by honor or a desire for revenge? Isn't that, a, that's part of it. But I think ambition is playing a role, and we're going to see in the next section here. But I also want us to see some parallels between these brothers. While one had a short view and the other took the long view, while one was acting kind of on his impulses and the other one seems to be more calculating, both of them have essentially said, right, if you look at their plans, I have to get a certain royal half-sibling into the same room as me. It's almost like chess, right? It's like I need to maneuver so that their king ends up there so that I can spring my trap. How do I maneuver that person, right? So we read a couple of weeks ago how Amnon sort of got advice from from his cousin about how I'll pretend you're sick and have her come over and all of that. Well, Absalom's kind of doing the same thing, but his was a little bit more elaborate. But basically, how do I get him into the same room as me? Both of them applied pressure and deceit to the king, their father, to make it happen. So it shows a little bit about their uh, priority stack, right? I'm sure they had a sense of needing to honor the king as king and as their father, right? They weren't completely, ah, whatever, I'm going to do what I want. No, no. But, But their desire to carry out their plan superseded that. So they were willing to to apply pressure and manipulation and deceit. They were willing to deceive their father, the king, in order to get what they want. And we see as Absalom's plan uh, played out here, we just read, and he was talking about, um, I have sheep shearers, and that can seem random to us, right? It's like saying Absalom had to go get an oil change. So he said, everyone come to my house and we'll have a barbecue because, behold, I have changed mine oil. That's, That's not... This was um, a, a sheep raising people, a pastoral people, when, they, when it's time to shear the sheep, it's a big deal, right? It still is now, but it was much more labor intensive. So they would bring the, the sheep together, they would bring in all these laborers to shear the sheep, and it was like a harvest. So it was traditionally a time to celebrate. And so for him to invite the family to come and celebrate was not unusual, that wasn't weird. Just as Amnon had said, I'm sick, please send my sister to me. Absalom had said, hey, I'm happy. I've got this great reason to celebrate. Let my family come to me. Now, Absalom, I think he anticipated David's response, right? He was, it was like a negotiating tactic where if you want to sell a house, a car, a boat, a bicycle, whatever, you're like, I want this much for it, right? You might, some people will do this, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm a horrible salesperson, so what do I know? I've been been on the receiving end of this. But you say, okay, I I really want this much. You say, I'm asking this much, knowing the person's going to be like, well, eh, you know, it's not that. They're going to kind of come down, well, no, a little bit, right? So you can haggle and end up ideally where you really wanted to be. You start by asking for more. So he's like, let everybody, let everybody come. David's like, nope. Okay, fine. If having the entire royal family over would be too much, at least let the crown, the crown prince come. At least let Amnon come. And it seems that there was, I don't know, right? We're having to imply or infer, like, what, what were the rules here? It looked like he had already invited most of the king's sons, all of the younger princes and stuff. Yeah, they're coming to the party. But he wants the king to come. No, no, we would be a burden to you. I'm assuming he's got to bring a whole entourage. There might be a security thing to it. I don't know what his, it's like, no, David said no. 
I think maybe Absalom expected that, and it's like, fine. If you won't come, at least send Amnon, who doesn't seem to have been automatically included in all the king's sons. Maybe as the, the heir apparent, he, he had kind of an official function. It's like, look, if you won't honor me with the king's presence at my celebration, okay, fine and good. Throw me a bone here. At least let the prince come. And maybe David's eyebrows went up. It's like, why do you want... Why do you want Absalom to come? It just says he pressed him. He was, come on, it'll be, you know, like he was, he was very much making his motive seem to be, I, I want this to be a celebration. It's a happy thing. And I think another parallel before we read the next section is that both Absalom and Amnon's plans, I think, um, they may have involved this guy Jonadab, who we met last week. We know that Jonadab, who was the king's nephew, so a cousin to these, both Amnon and Absalom, he clearly advised Amnon on what to do. Was he involved in Absalom's plans as well? I wonder. Let's keep reading here this next section, verses 30 to 33, which I think starts to show us some questionable motives here. It says, so remember, we had just read um, at this party, this banquet, Absalom's servants had got up and struck down Amnon. All the king's sons arose, got on their their mules, and left. It says, while they were on their way, news came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, and not one of them has left. I just want to pause. Those who are like, social media is like totally destroying our ability to communicate with its spread of misinformation. This is a human condition. It's happening here. I, how did David get this news? Right? Did someone tweet? They had a bird? Quick, tell him, and he flew. I, I suspect, right, all of the king's sons are there. They've got servants or whatever. And as soon as the swords came out, some of them booked it out of there earlier than others. Maybe some of them had faster mules. But a message gets to King David... And it's this, Amnon has killed all the king's son. Not one of them is left. And then the king arose, tore his garments, and lay on the earth. And all his servants who were standing by tore their garments. But Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, said, Let not my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons. For Amnon alone is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined from the day Amnon violated his sister Tamar. Now, therefore, let not my lord the king so take it to heart as to suppose that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon alone is dead. So I want to look at some motives here. First, I want to back up to Absalom. And I had said that his plan, I think, is motivated by ambition. And some of that is because we know the next chapter. If you're at all familiar with the story, you know he's got bigger, um, bigger fish to fry than avenging his sister. But in this instance, was he motivated by honor or revenge or ambition? The first thought that occurred, and I said, we don't know who brought this message to King David. Someone who was at Absalom's, perceived something happening, and got out before they saw, right? So think about that. One of these servants who's familiar with the family and court dynamics, they're there having lunch, I don't know. Um, They're drinking wine, it's festive. Some kind of command is issued, and as soon as the swords come out, where does this person's thought go? Absalom is going to kill all the king's sons. That's interesting, right? The first thought that occurred once the swords came out at Absalom's was that he was going to kill all the king's sons, all the potential rivals for the throne. This was the report that came to King David via that first servant or whoever it was that got out of there. Interestingly, Absalom's character must have been such that this report sounded plausible. Right? Because you'll note when this messenger comes and says, I've just come from Absalom's where the party is, and, and Absalom has killed all the king's sons, the king doesn't go, What? That's crazy. My son would never that he would never do that. You must be mistaken. What's going on? Get me get me some real information here. We need to see what's going on. He doesn't say that. This guy comes in out of breath. <gasps> Absalom has struck down all the king's sons. Not one of them is left. David hears this and immediately 
believes that it's true. It's a plausible story. It's like he's gone and done it. And he rips his clothes and he starts to grieve and weep. Absalom's ambition, not just his bitterness over how his sister was treated, but his overall ambition as the, not the heir to the throne, but like kind of next in line, it must have been at least partly visible to those around him, or this would have been, this rumor wouldn't have got off the ground. Then we see this guy, Jonadab. This is the same guy that advised Amnon, and he's portrayed as, as David's relative and his advisor. He is in the king's presence, and he presumes to speak to the king um, unbidden, right? The king doesn't say, Jonadab, what do you think? The king is, is expressing grief, and Jonadab speaks up and offers insight and advice. I find that interesting, that Jonadab is even there. Again, we don't know what's not recorded. I, I want to be careful when I'm saying this is what it says and this is just what I'm wondering and thinking. But listen, when David was furious over the affair with Amnon and Tamar, was Jonadab's role in that whole plot just not clearly seen? When David says to Amnon, his, his firstborn, the crown prince, what were you thinking? What was, right? Did he never turn and go, well, it was Joe's idea, right? I didn't know. I was all like Twitter-pated. And he's like, pretend you're sick. And it was him. Like, did he never do that? Maybe not. Maybe he's like, he just owned it. Or maybe he did. Maybe, um, maybe Amnon or maybe Jonadab was, the blame was shifted his way. And he just weaseled out of it another way. But however things played out, Jonadab didn't only retain his position, right? He's just a cousin, but here he is kind of in the court, in the royal family. Um, it looks like he even got a promotion, right? Because earlier he was seen as the advisor or the friend to Prince Amnon, and here he is advising the king himself. Now, maybe it's like, well, he's going to stay here while Amnon goes, whatever. He still managed to stay in his role, which seems... Notable to me. He also seems awfully certain about events that he did not witness and the motives behind them, right? The only news they have so far is supposedly an eyewitness account. Absalom has killed every last one of your sons. David's like, I can't even remember how many. No, all of them. They're all, right? And Jonadab's like, no, nope, wrong. It can't, don't even listen to this guy. They're not all dead. It was Absalom's doing it, only Amnon's dead. It's like, wow, that is, that is very certain and oddly specific information you have, Jonadab. What's going on? No one seems to ask, but I just, I wonder, right? And he doesn't just say what happened, but he's pretty sure about the motives behind them. He says, this is because, um, you know, Absalom's been plotting this ever since Amnon violated his sister. I think Jonadab, in reminding the king of the incident with Tamar, he frames the murder of Absalom, not as, or sorry, the murder of Amnon. I keep getting these guys mixed up, I'm sorry. Not as, oh, this is a coup. This is a, this is a run for the throne by Absalom. It's like, no, no. He said, because that's what it looked like. If you're killing all the other king's sons, there's only one reason to do that, right? You're making a run for the throne and you don't want to have to worry about any other but he reframes it as a premeditated honor killing. He basically says, listen, don't worry about Absalom's ambitions regarding the throne. That's not what's going on. He was merely avenging his sister's honor. And he uses words that kind of downplay it, right? In fact, he says, do not take it to heart. It's the same phrase that Absalom used when he was comforting Tamar. She's like, she's torn her robes and got ashes on her head and she's grieving the fact that she's been violated she goes and her brother's like was this Amnon was he okay yeah don't take it to heart there there just you know and that might have been yeah no don't say anything I'll handle that I just is this a common phrase it's the same words and some scholars think that Jonadab was actually in league with Absalom the whole time and that he gave Amnon that advice. You know what you should do is arrange to violate Absalom's sister, right? It, it makes Tamar a 
pawn in this cruel game, but it creates a situation in which Absalom could kill Amnon without anyone suspecting that he was just removing obstacles between himself and the throne. He's sitting there, I'm not going to be king as long as Absalom's alive, I wish I could just kill him. It's like, if you do that, you're a traitor, you'll never be king, you'll go to jail, you'll whatever, right? It's like, how could I do it without anyone suspecting? It's like, dude, you're, you're second in line for the throne. If you kill Amnon, everyone's going to know why, unless, what would your other motive be? And maybe this whole thing was a setup. Maybe he was less of a friend to Amnon and actually less loyal to David than than he appears. Sadly, this is the last time this guy shows up. He did, I, I'm like, but where, where was he later? When, we don't know. I, it's so frustrating. Anyway, we just wonder. So, then, so this has all happened, and now we see the aftermath of this revenge, this, this event, this murder. It says, but Absalom fled, and the young man who kept watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. So this is like the guy with David. All of these people are coming from from the party. Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come, as your servant said. Or, yeah, just as your servant said, so it has come about. And as soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's sons came, and they lifted up their voice and wept, and the king also, and all of his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled, and he went to Talmai, the son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Geshur and was there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. So three pieces of this aftermath before we land the plane here. First, Absalom fled. He did the deed. He commanded his servants, right? When I give you the word, kill this guy. Don't worry, I'm... I'm I'm a prince and I'm telling you to do your job, right? After it's done, he's gone. Did he bring these poor guys with him? I don't know. That would have been really awkward, right? Standing there with the bloody... But he told me, who told you? Where did he go? (laughs) Right? But he, he booked it out. And I think that perhaps goes against the idea that Absalom was acting out of a clear conscience, solely out of this desire to honorably uphold the law and establish righteousness in Israel. What Amnon did was wrong. The king should have dealt with it. He didn't. So I acted righteously because if he was honestly convinced that he was in the right, if not by the letter of the law, by the spirit of the law, running away is not the kind of thing that you would do. But he, he left pretty quick. And he clearly had a plan in place. We know this guy is a planner. I find it, you know, like none of his actions are rash. He waited two years to take his revenge. So I find it highly unlikely that he didn't plan for, what do I do after he's dead, right? He's made arrangements. And so he runs to this place with the difficult to pronounce names, this Talmai, the son of Amihud, king of Geshur. That's actually his grandfather on his mother's side. His mother, Maka, she's the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. So Geshur is this little city-state that was, as near as we can tell, just kind of on the other side of the Jordan. And they had friendly relationships with Israel, right? David had married the daughter. That's kind of a political allegiance. So this king over here has diplomatic relations with Israel, and his grandson has come to live with him. So... The court of David demanding that Absalom be extradited and face justice, that's going to be tricky. He's with Grandpa. Grandpa's not going to turn him over. You come and get him, if you, right? So he had this plan, and I think he's reasonably safe there. So Absalom ran away. He fled. Um, Amnon, meanwhile, um, he was dead. He was dead. He died. So you see that the king and his sons and his servants, they properly, they grieved the death of the heir apparent. They wept bitterly. They lifted their voices and wept. And this is is probably a combination of genuine heartfelt emotion in a time and place and in a culture where that was expressed. And it was also probably just what one does. We have cultural rules about what you do when someone dies. They're not written down. You're like, I've never read that. Where You know, right? 
a funeral in Canada, you come in, it tends to be quiet. My, my condolences, my apologies, I'm so sorry. Sorry for your loss, right? We speak softly. We, you don't come in, ah! wailing, right? But in other parts of the world, that is the highest respect you can show the deceased. You wail, you lift your voice, you express emotions. Even if you don't genuinely feel them, ah! you're really screaming a lot. Were you close? No, no, but I mean, he's a friend of the family and you got it right. Ah! So this is both the proper way to express it, but I think it's like this was, this was family. How close were these brothers? I don't know. This does not seem to be a real tight-knit crew. Amnon was a lot older than... You remember, Amnon's like a grown-up. He's got a little baby brother, Solomon, kicking around here somewhere, right? David just won't stop marrying people and having... So it's a kind of a stretched-out, multi-blended family situation. But this guy was a brother, the son of David, the prince. So they mourn. He's dead. This is a blow to the kingdom. I think they mourn the loss in the family, but also the painful rift in the royal family. It'd be one thing if it's like news came, it's like, your highness, I'm so sorry, but your oldest son, Amnon, whom you love, he was out riding a mule and uh, like a boulder fell on him. That's awful. But it's like, this was like, he was killed by his own brother. Like this is, this is for me, this is a betrayal here. Like that's dark. This is painful and ugly because you see, right? Revenge did not bring healing at all. It only added to the pain. Where's Tamar in all of this? She's not mentioned. She's been living in the household of Absalom, a desolate woman. As far as I know, she's still taken care of. But she doesn't somehow get to come out and hit reset on her life. Now that Amnon's dead, my reputation is clear. I'm considered pure and I can resume my... It's like, no, no, you're still done, right? Nothing is undone. We've just got this new gash on the family. And we also see here... Probably culturally it was not as awkward as it seems when I'm looking at it with my 21st century eyes. But they're all weeping and mourning and I notice that Jonadab makes sure that David sees that he was right. It's always that guy, right? You see, your highness, it was just what I said, that was actually the way it went. You notice, right? So I was correct about Absalom's motives. He was merely, right? Do you, yes, yes, you were right, very good, here's a cookie. My son is dead, right? I don't know if it was that callous. But we see Jonadab wanting to make sure, establishing the narrative, right? This was revenge, nothing more. Nothing to see here, your highness. Don't worry about Absalom plotting and scheming while he's with his grandpa. It's done. And we see that David ends up mourning and grieving over two sons. He mourned the death of his firstborn son, Amnon, who was dead. But knowing that Absalom was alive and yet in exile caused him this unique grief. It's like one is a painful wound that heals and the other is maybe not as serious a wound, but it won't heal. Every day his son is dying. He's in exile and his heart goes out to him. I don't know exactly what was going on with David. Was he longing to gather his living sons together to try and bring healing to this broken family to comfort him for the sons that he's lost? Because he's lost Amnon and he's also lost Bathsheba's firstborn. But I wonder if David's guilt over his own crimes is actually adding to his grief. I wonder, is it possible that when David's thinking about this, thinking about Absalom, what he's done and where he is. He's far away. I can't see him. He's over there. And he's rolling the whole thing over in his mind. What it says, his heart is going out to him. Did he ever think? Did he ever see Absalom maybe as a better man than himself? Someone who acted justly, even when it cost him. It cost him. He's, he's, he's not at home. He's in exile. But, but his, like, he had to do the right thing. Did David see that? I don't know. But to conclude, we see that Absalom did, in a sense, what David should have done. Acting justly, David should have punished sin in his son Amnon, and he didn't. Absalom did what David should have done, but also, in a way, Amnon got the punishment that David should have received. Death as the just result of his own lust and murder. I think that complicates this whole thing. How can David address his sons for doing the very things that he is guilty of? I think it's difficult to not see the parallels to our own story. 
as we come to the Lord's table today, and we're going to have communion together. We've all been guilty, right? All of us, we've been guilty of sin against a holy God. Justice demands our death as a result, our exile, our separation from God. But God sent his son to take the punishment that we deserve, to be both exiled from his father and murdered by his brothers um, so that our sin could be forgiven, not merely covered up, not merely ignored, not merely yelled at and then not dealt with, but actually forgiven 